Global warming is the debate that never was. It hit the news headlines 20 years ago, was never really questioned, and we've been spammed by it ever since. With the rapid decline in regular church going, our innate desire for spirituality can find a home in the new church, the Church of Global Warming. This church tells us we are destroying the planet by our consumerist greed. It plays on the classic guilt complex. We crave too many goodies in life and, to get them, are burning too many fossil fuels. This releases CO2 into the atmosphere, which acts as a greenhouse gas, and this is overheating the planet. Stop consuming, save the planet. A powerful message indeed, and if true, we should listen to. But whether it's true or not is the big question. The Church of Global Warming believes that man-made global warming is gospel. However, every large-scale church always has its heretics. One of the more vocal heretics, or should I say skeptics, over the years to the CO2 argument has been Vaclav Klaus. He lived under repressive communism, survived it, and is a famous freethinker who has risen to the presidency of the European Union. He sees ambitious environmentalism as the new communism. It is an ideology that aims to replace the free and spontaneous evolution of mankind by a sort of central, now global planning. It is not about climatology. It's about freedom. Whether you agree that the true aim of the Church of Global Warming is control, or is it genuine concern for the environment is up to you. However, the Church is requesting massive worldwide economic restrictions on trade and energy production. And this definitely requires centralized global planning of human development. That's why, motives aside, we really have to question the need for it and analyze what the consequences will be. Is man-made, also known as anthropogenic, CO2 the primary cause of the global warming we've seen since the Industrial Revolution? Firstly, we aim to examine the science behind anthropogenic global warming. Secondly, we also aim to discuss something that has been, perhaps, more crucial in the science, sadly, in this debate, the politics. In addition, we will delve into the social and economic costs of action, or alternatively, inaction. We've been spammed by the press telling us of the disaster that awaits us. The planet is dying. Do something. Well, what do you expect? Bold headlines and fear-mongering cells. The less interesting viewpoint that imminent, global environmental disaster does not await us is somewhat less interesting, not so newsworthy. The wide-ranging debate that we rarely see in our mainstream press is, however, raging underground on the web. This presentation tries to condense as much of it as possible into, hopefully, a palatable form. Global warming is a hot and contentious topic. The field of study is massive, and so are the number of data sources that are cited. One could argue, till the cows come home, the relative reliability of each. Thus, where possible, we use the least controversial, most universally acceptable form. For instance, when given the choice between satellite and surface temperature records, we chose the latter, as it is the preferred source by those who believe in CO2-based global warming. However, with that said, the conclusions drawn from analyses of these data sets may be a tad more controversial. So, what is global warming, and why should it be linked to CO2? Good question. In this case, global warming can be defined as the unnatural warming up of the planet as a whole due to increased greenhouse gases, in particular, man-made carbon dioxide. The greenhouse effect in itself is not harmful, far from it. It makes Earth the habitable place it is, by warming it up by about 30 degrees. CO2 is one of the many greenhouse gases involved in this warming, with water being the most important. Instead of the sun's rays just hitting the Earth's surface and bouncing straight out back into space, the atmospheric gases and clouds absorb, then readmit them back to the surface again, increasing the temperature. Without greenhouse gases, man and life as we know it would not exist. They in themselves are not a bad thing. So what is all the fuss about? If greenhouse gases are essential for man's survival, why does having a few more create a cause for concern? Well, Sir John Houghton, one of the most important scientists involved in discovering this threat, describes it dramatically as follows. The impacts of global warming are such that I have no hesitation in describing it as a weapon of mass destruction. And we really have to take action, and we have to take it as fast as we can. Amen. 
Under his leadership of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, known as the IPCC, we first heard of the global catastrophe we're digging ourselves into. The influential IPCC are the leading international authority in the global warming movement and have the ear of the majority of the world's leaders. Paralleling the rhetoric of George Bush, Sir John Houghton said, global warming is a weapon of mass destruction. Well, it could possibly affect us in a number of ways. There will be, and perhaps we are already seeing, severe droughts alongside severe storms. The melting of the ice caps will lead to flooding of low-lying areas, as perhaps we've seen already by Hurricane Katrina. In addition, deadly tropical diseases such as malaria will spread further afield to currently cooler climes. To understand global warming, you need to understand its history. The origin of global warming was politically motivated. That in itself does not mean it's incorrect, but it does help explain why the majority of politicians around the world, those who we generally trust to lead us well, believe in it. We are determined to be part of the solution to climate change. To move along a climate change agenda. We have got to persuade people around the world to change their behaviour as well. Every scientist all across the world have determined that the climate is changing. Who are we to disagree with them? Well, if you see it as really an issue of energy security, not of impending global meltdown, then you can see why our politicians are happy to tow the party line. Up until the 1980s, the world scientists were ablaze with talk of the upcoming catastrophe that was the Ice Age. A frozen world is a dead world, far more than a gloriously balmy warm one. Maggie Thatcher became Britain's Prime Minister in her own blaze of catastrophes. The massive mining industry had collapsed. The miners were on strike and had ousted her predecessor from power. And OPEC quadrupled the price of oil overnight. The strikers, Scottish miners reinforced by men from North East England and Yorkshire, withdrew, regrouped and countercharged. There followed some of the most violent clashes on the picket lines in Scotland for some weeks. With cheap coal and oil a thing of the past, how could we safeguard our energy supplies? The danger of global warming is as yet unseen. But real enough for us to make changes and sacrifices so that we do not live at the expense of future generations. In comes the intensely unpopular but necessary prospect of nuclear power. In a bizarre twist of fate, a Faustian pact was made between the far right, Maggie the Iron Maiden, and the far left, the extreme environmentalists. 